Thank you for tuning into Healing Rays. In this video, I share what it was like to move from a home life surrounded by a largely Black community, where I was one of many, to an academic and professional life, where I was one of few, largely surrounded by and having my success very much depend upon white relationships. Andre and I were freshman roommates when he made that transition to being one of few. And we reflect on how our experiences adapting to a new college environment differed and how our backgrounds helped shape those differences. So let's get to that conversation now. Enjoy. turn to the other side, you know, I know you say you were kind of, on the, you know, you seem to be suggesting that you were on the luckier side of things in terms of how race affected you versus maybe some of the people in your social circle. Yeah. And were there, were, were there any moments that were kind of on the negative side where, where something happened in your life that was racially, that was related to race that had some kind of negative impact on you? in the way that you felt about your race and, you know, being black in America and, you know, whatever it's effects after that. I mean, maybe you have been kind of. That personally happened to me. Yeah. That personally happened to me. It's okay if the answer is no. I mean, I, we don't have to. Well, it's not. But I'm just, I want to learn from you and your experience. And so. How can I put, it? I'm going to say it like this. The answer is not necessarily no, but the answer is those things can be mitigated when you, quite frankly, largely stick to your own group. So, mm -hmm. you know, you know what I mean? And so, like I said, we don't have, and my, I mean, I think my stepbrother has a white friend, but like my mama, my, my mama don't have white friends. It's not like, cause she's not friendly or whatever, but we yeah. just, like I said, all of my life, I've always been around, but it wasn't until I got grown and became an adult that I started living life around white people. And yeah. so, and I don't, I can't speak for other black people, but for me personally, a lot of that was <laughs> mitigated because I just kind of stuck to my own group. Yeah. Um, and, or other minorities. If it wasn't my own group, other minorities, because I mean, my husband to be is Latino. Yeah. Uh, or other minorities. And sometimes it would happen with other minorities, but generally not. Yeah. Yeah. But, so for me, yeah. Now, had I been like some of my friends who were one of few, then totally, it totally would have happened. But no. through economic circumstance, I was never in a one of few environment. And um, I've just largely kind of stuck to my own group. Yeah. And probably because I was fearful of those experiences. So yeah. I just kind of stuck to black people. <laughs> and did you not, did you, did you experience any negative impacts within the black community? So you, cause you had mentioned yep. lighter. Um, and I don't know the degree to which that mattered within your community. I mean, that I'll would explain it. <laughs> so first of all, what I'm talking, it may be new to you, but what I'm talking about is not new to, to black people um, in the United States at all. Um, there is definitely a uh, framework of can, well, I'm gonna, how can I say this? Let me rephrase. There can be a framework of colorism with some black people. Yeah. And we, in black community, we call it being color stroke. I had some members of my family who are color stroke. And, you know, and that's when I learned that lighter is more palatable lighter was more desired. And so I've had friction sometimes with black people because of stereotypes about light people that mm -hmm. we're uppity, <laughs> like that we're, you know, that we basically think we're better because we are lighter. That's the messaging that comes through sometimes in society. And I won't lie, maybe sometimes I've unwittingly carried myself in that manner. Or sometimes maybe maybe when I was feeling insecure, I've wittingly carried myself in that manner. I'll own that. You yeah. know, 
but it was, I will tell you now the motivation is insecurity. It was never because I deeply thought I'm better than other people. It's because yeah. I felt insecure about some aspect of my life and that's a way to feel triumph over others. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, and it is painful. I have siblings who are dark, who are, you know, who are darker. Yeah. I just a tad much, much darker than I. Um, and when they talk about the experiences of things that have been said to them, to my brothers, um, it's arresting by other black people, by, by other black people, you know? Mm -hmm. um, that's why I say words have power and it is possible for you to adopt the framework of the very same people who subjugated you and to apply that framework in situations. And whether you're witting or unwittingly do it, you're applying that framework, which is still perpetuating a vicious cycle, yeah. right? And architecting an environment where people don't have as much support to live a thriving life. I know with respect to Black women, because I have a lot of Black female friends who are very close to me, like, you know, it sends a clear message when all the black men in your life only date light skinned black women. So, okay, like, you know, I mean, that like actions and words send messages, like they just do. And that, that's hurt, that can be hurtful, you know, because yeah. like, like I said, because I mean, who doesn't want to find the one and share your life? And then you feel like that's going to be hard or more difficult than others just because you were born looking a certain way. Yeah. Really sit with that. That, it, that my finding a partner in life is gonna be harder because of something I just could not control because I was born with a certain skin color. Yeah. That's yeah. hard. And that, and that hurts feelings. That's hurtful. That is yeah. hurtful. Yeah. Well, I, f I feel like it's, I mean, you're getting not just at the hurtful feelings, you're also getting at just the powerlessness because you alone cannot by yourself change the norms. Uh, I mean, certainly you can protect yourself, like you protected yourself in a certain way, right? Uh, as you were suggesting. So there's not no actions, but your actions are limited. Um, yeah. And I also want to talk about, I believe the converse is the correct word to use. The converse of that, <clears throat> and I'm going to own this as a light-skinned Black person, so we're going to talk about my individual experience, the sense of being feeling powerful over yeah. something you had no control over. Yeah. Knowing that I can walk into a store and probably not get followed around. Or no, don't get me wrong. Like I said, I always remember I'm black. So anything can happen to me. Yeah. But you know, knowing that in the dating world that I could be desired because yeah. of being light skinned, like yeah. that's an ego trip. It is. And 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 you know. And I really strive the times to, because I know this will be seen by people, that I have been disrespectful or irreverent or seem as though I was coming across as better. I publicly want to apologize to anyone who sees this and they've experienced, that was their experience of me. Yeah. And as well to tell you that that was insecurity manifesting itself. Yeah. And totally my ego, egoic self trying to self-protect the child within and with respect to my own narrative about myself. Yeah. It's yeah. not, I, I would offer it to the world that that's not the truth of who I am. Yeah. But it is an ego trip knowing that you have a sense of power, if you will, because of your skin color. And that's the closest thing I can understand to, maybe, to possibly being white. The fact that mm -hmm. I have light skin. With respect to um, living, it wasn't until I got grown that I started living my life around white people. You were the first of that, right? So mm -hmm. in my life, I went from living in a mostly black neighborhood. There were some white people, but mostly black neighborhood with, and a lot of Asian people as well, to going to college with you. And it was the first time that I was in a residential setting with white people. So it's different. We have a friend and maybe go over their house every now and again or whatever. But when you're in a residential setting, so, and that means something, sharing a bathroom with white people and seeing mm -hmm. how white people live and, and 
I, boy, oh boy, oh boy, do I remember what are you conversations remembering? with other Black people uh -huh. when we got to university comparing notes about how, let me not, don't, 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 how people live. Were you anxious at all? Because in that clip, you talk about sticking to your own, right? Like how important, I mean, it, Andre, if I listened, to, when I listened to that just now, it came up multiple times, right? Career, you talked about, that's why we want to be entrepreneurs, right? It's a, it's a sense of not wanting to, or being hesitant at the very least, being interdependent um, with yes. white people, right? Not okay. having your own mm -hmm. destiny, you know, control of your own destiny in some way, sticking to your own socially, sticking to your own when it came, comes to work. So there was a common theme, you know, having listened to it again, that comes out in these multiple aspects, but then here you are being thrown in this new situation where you had this motivation to stick with your own and you clearly don't have that ability anymore. What was that? Were you anxious about that? Like what, was there an adjustment in, in uh, with that in particular for you? I have answers to all of these. So first to that question, I, you know how something can happen to you that's so new that you're naive? So I was very naive when I went to university. And, and had to learn the ways of presenting and being around white people. And I cringe at some of my moments um, just because I just didn't have, so where others of, other Black people of our university were one of few, and there were a lot of whites or in their experiences, they knew how to show up around white people. Whereas I just showed up the way I'd always been showing up in the red, you know, for in front of anyone. And at times that was rebuffed. Um, Can you, you give know. a specific experience of what that looks like? Like what I'd is- I'd rather the, not. <laughs> what's that? I, I don't want to relive it because it, it does, be, I mean, that, that was just, it was rebuffed. So, but in general, uh, I, I was not, I wasn't anxious because I just didn't know what I was getting into. But as I understood where I was and what I was getting into, then I became anxious. Mm -hmm. Like, wait a minute, this is a different environment. There are different rules of engagement in this environment. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to push you into, into share, you know, reliving something that you don't want to relive. Maybe if we can put aside the being rebuffed for it. And you don't have to think about that, but if you could just explain maybe what it's what it means to present yourself in a certain way that's that's well received and what it means to present yourself in a way that's 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 more natural to your upbringing, like what's because I, I don't even have a sense of what that what that would look like, especially because, as you just shared, I felt like we got along really well. I don't know that maybe there were times that that I made you feel uncomfortable because of my reactions, but I always felt you were just. Andre, right? Um, and um, there, there didn't seem to be anything extraordinarily different um, that I even took note of. You know, I mean, you had different phrases that you use. In fact, one person used the phrase recently, um, first time I've heard it since college, all that in a bag of chips. Um, <laughs> I was like, I know who used to say that. <laughs> Uh, and that's an example. So yeah, so you just would have example. phrases, but I always found them. I don't know. I mean, endearing is probably not the right word, but you had a different language, right? You just had different sayings. I had different sayings, and so I didn't really ever. F I, I don't really know what that looks like, Andre. To need to present yourself in one way and then feel the need to present yourself in another way. I can explain it to you. In all environments, there are rules of engagement. There are social norms. There's a way you present, there's a way you show up. And there are two personas, both public and private. And what I didn't know were the rules of engagement of how to show up around white affluent people and how to present and how to, you know, so that, I mean, part of, I mean, part of university is learning, but it's also to make social connections. I mean, Facebook existed for a reason. It's the social network. So that's a very pivotal time in a young person's life. And if you navigate it deftly, you could come out on the other end very successful. 
And I just was not cognizant of any of that. I did was not cognizant of any of the implications of of nurturing a social success and learning the rules of engagement of social success. I got lucky with you. The fact that we became friends and now we're doing this, you know, project that I pray impacts the world. And, you know, you never judged me for like, for example, phrase phraseology I may have used, right? But there are others in that environment who would have judged that, right? Like who would have, you know, there are Black people who have worked very hard to, to be associated with the best of what we have to offer as a race and as individuals. And depending on how you present, sometimes that may be diminished by how you're presenting. So what and does it take to be socially, about. what does it take to be social? Because I actually, I mean, this is another example of something that you seem to have been really conscious of and i after the fact yes at the time i was not yeah right that you felt the need to be conscious of after the fact i understand that I, I, i'm still not conscious of that um like what when you say what does it mean that's sweet be... that, that's that, no that, that's really sweet about you look look what does it mean to be socially successful like like what did you feel i'm gonna tell you, you... What, what, what did you learn? What are like one or two examples? You know what? I'm going to, let me use you as an example. Use me as an I've example. Seen it. I'm going to use you as an example. I've seen it. Yeah. For example, you come from a Jewish heritage. You are yep. a very smart guy. I have always, uh, I've always been, you know, I had a deep respect for your intellect. You could, this world would have, could have been your oyster first, Stanford. You clearly did well academically. Leverage that into investment banking. Take that investment banking, leverage that through a hedge fund. And you could have, you know, used the fact that you are Jewish, you come from a Jewish background, you completely understand Jewishness and your intellect. And from a material perspective, I'm not emotionally, people are on their own, but socially successful from a material perspective, you could have created all kinds of relationships that could have brought hordes of material success to you. Mm -hmm. um, and not only that, coming from LA, the film industry, the TV industry, like, you know, and I say that about, I say, number one, because you have the talent. Number two, you come from a community where many people have been successful in those arenas and those disciplines like banking and then entertainment, right? And you were, in, you were well placed in an environment. And what I mean by social success, when you're someone like me, who comes, you know, from a large city, but from, a, you know, from a no name community in that large city, from one of many public schools, you know, you're on, you're trying to transition cast. And I, I've, I have transitioned cast in my life, but the whole premise of, you know, me being at that university or not the whole, but part of the premise of my desire to go. And this is both on my part and what people projected onto me was to attain a certain amount of social success so that it can bring material success. You know, like making the right connections, meeting the right people, being friends with the right people's children. I mean, shit, you think people are outrageously wealthy now? They were wealthy back then. But mm -hmm. I had no, I just saw it just as a university experience. I was not cognizant of, of any of that. And now that I am, I wonder maybe my life could have been very different had I come from a background and who knows, like, you know, I had a friend once tell me that the kind of place where we went to school, white people didn't come there to meet us. So that's why you don't, you may have some lasting friendships with a few black people, but not with a lot of black people. They came there for their own, you know, to achieve their own social success and cross population of, of social networks and such. But that's what it means to me. And just when you're cognizant of it, when you're prepared for it, you can really leverage that to some huge opportunities in the in those early years and even later in life. So I'm, I'm still having a little hard time, like grabbing onto what does that what it actually looks like, because because the the what you brought up was the idea of presenting yourself, right? And that a certain way of presenting yourself leads to social success. Mm -hmm. um, when you're black, that's true. Yes. And then and then you had to learn that differently when you went to university. Um, so like, what's something you would have said 
previously and then you wouldn't have said it or said it. I'll, I'll use that. I cringe at using that kind of vernacular with with you and other people at university. Um, vernacular like he's all, all that, that in a bag of chips, for example. I cringe at that now that I'm an adult and trying to be professional. Uh, and the reason I cringe is because now I understand that people judge your language uh, and your language and the you know, phraseology that you architect when you are communicating to people mm. uh, says something about you or people want it to say something about you. You know, when people start using a lot of a lot of large words, what people would call SAT words, which I tend to do. Oh, that's another thing I noticed. I love the way that I speak. Uh, but when you, because I learned to integrate both, I learned to integrate all that in the bag of chips and the word vernacular, mm -hmm. but that took time to do, you know, because, and I, I realized that, you know, I need to, when, I need to show a certain face to show these people that I'm someone who would be worthy of your social connection and we can help each other's social success. Mm -hmm. And when you're black people, we really have to prove that. Because we're already being, uh, you know, sort of looked down upon for being black, and people have all these stereotypes about being black that you, are, what you know, you're not educated, you, or at least if you are educated, then you come from a background that's not educated, and and you have nothing of real value to offer a white person of wealth, which is not true. But when you're around all of that, you really have to be mindful that that um, that uh, notion could undergird how they're perceiving you in a moment. And something with like, such as language, you, you know, the phrase, all that in a bag of chips. Yeah, that's fun and everything. And it's, and it's, and it's, you know, endearing, but it also, you know, ask yourself when you're not from a community where you express yourself in such a way, you're like, who says that? And what does that mean by the person who's using it? Does so what, sense? so what I'm hearing, if I, if I, and I, and I know you don't want to get into the details of it. Um, I mean, if you, unless you do want to feel comfortable sharing you went so we met in university you came from this you know one of many background though i still have questions about that with regard to the school you went to and working class so because i want everyone to understand there is a black elite like there is and but i'm no way i, I did was no way part of it so yeah. what i've observed what i had observed is that uh, African American people, black people who were part of the black elite, had a much easier time in that transition. Many of them, also people who went to uh, East Coast boarding schools, <laughs> and we know who they are. <laughs> we know this, who the schools are, but they had an easier time with that transition. And I came from none of that. Like I hate to put it like this, but I was, you know, plucked right out of you know, working class you know, black every, everyday living city and then put in this very illustrious environment, I guess you'd say. So I was one of many in my background, but look at the many I was a part. I was a many, you know, the people that I went to school with, they didn't become CEOs and start mm -hmm. tech companies and shit like that. I mean, they, they, they came, they, they became professionals but not to the extent that you would see from the from our university background. Mm -hmm. So you came from that background. You're now thrown into this situation where you're one of few. It sounded like, and tell me if I'm not hearing this correctly, you also felt some sense of responsibility, pressure, um, expectation around making the most of your experience there um, as a way to be upwardly mobile economically. Yes, especially. definitely. And so, and then you were naive, as you put it, in the sense that you just felt like you could be yourself um, <laughs> mm -hmm. and express yourself. But then in some ways, as you put it, you got rebuffed. So you get some sort of signal from the environment that, hey, to be that is not all right. And you have to deal with being in a one of few environment. <laughs> you have to deal with all the expectations that you feel you have in terms of making the most out of it and so you feel a and hold up couple that with being a homosexual <laughs> yeah yeah so add that into it so you feel this motivation to correct in some way to learn what the norms are of communication to be socially successful you know 
I don't, okay, we can talk about university. We can talk about race. I've even had to do navigate this front as a guy self-identify everyone as a gay man, as a gay man. Like I had to learn mm -hmm. how to show up around. And to this day, I don't have very many gay male friends. Yeah. I had to learn how to show up around gay men. Yeah, of all races and, and especially black gay men, you know, yeah. so black communities are, have, you know, been harsh on gay men. But mm -hmm. I mean, I had to learn the rules of engagement, how you show up, how you present. Uh, so let me let me let me ask you a question. I didn't have to deal with being rebuffed, as you said, right? I, um, um, I was just being who I am, like you said, mm -hmm. Californian, Southern Californian. Um, um, I, although a lot of people thought I was from the East Coast because of my directness. Um, so I, but oh, this is Todd. Todd is showing up the way Todd knows how to show up, the way Todd has learned how to show up. If I get, and this is because I don't really know what being rebuffed looks like. If I do get, like if someone doesn't like who Todd is in some ways, I, I think, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say this, but to hell with you for, you know, for lack of a better terminology, right? It's like, I'm going to find the people who, who accept who I am, who like who I am. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not thinking about mm -hmm. how to socially adjust. I'm thinking I'll yeah. find where my place is. What I'm just expressing my experience. And so I'm trying, th and, and through that, trying to understand what what motivated you to feel like you had to adjust who you were? What did you think wouldn't happen if you didn't adjust? Thank you for watching this episode of Healing Race. To see the answer to the question you just heard, stay with us for a link to our next video. If you wanna see more Healing Race conversations, please subscribe to our channel, share this video with friends and family, and like and comment on the video below. To be a guest on one of our episodes and have an open, real, constructive conversation about race, email us at guests at healingratio.com. And if there are topics you think we should cover, we'd love to hear them. So email your ideas to topics at healingraceshow.com. Now, if you'd like to watch our next episode, go ahead and click the video below me. Or click the video below me to see a different compelling Healing Race episode. As always, thanks for your support. We look forward to continuing the conversation with you.